is calling or have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well but Jesus is behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait but Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and drain them for joy from the ashes a new life is born but Jesus is calling oh come song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you yes we live for you oh Jesus Jesus the name above Every other name, Jesus. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we live for you. You are holy. Spirit, to put our trust in you, 
to seek you, to want you, to want to be changed by your word that we're about to <laughs> that we're about to hear, and that the Spirit would move through us, and that we would continue to get a new heart and love you, just a heart that can love you and love others, love the church. In your son's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So you don't have to raise your hand if you've seen it, uh, but I'm curious. uh, But you just answered the question in your head, and I'm talking about the movie, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, I got a hand anyway. Okay, so you can raise your hands if you want to. That's fine. Um, So I'm going to tell you what happens in the end. Can't really apologize for spoiling it. It, The movie is 30 years old. So (laughs) if you haven't seen it yet, you know... um, so, kids, if you haven't seen it yet, when I get to what happens in the end, and you just go la, 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 and you don't have to listen to that part. Okay, so in the whole movie, the, the good guys and the bad guys are searching for the Holy Grail, which is this, this mythical object that does not exist, which is supposedly a cup uh, of Christ's, that if you uh, drink water that is in this cup, then you will have everlasting life. So, certainly not the first movie or a story uh, to be about the Holy Grail, and probably not the last one. Uh, wh- it is really interesting that the quest is for this object that will give you everlasting life. Not the only story like this. In fact, there are lots of them. Uh, but in this one, there's something that happens in the end that I don't think I realized it the first time I watched it, but maybe on you know the 22nd viewing, uh, I figured it out. Uh, and what happens at the end is when they find the Grail... They find it in a cave, and it's being guarded by a knight from the Middle Ages. So he's been alive, apparently, for 500 plus years. And the reason why he's been alive for so long, according to the story, is because he's been drinking water from this cup, the Holy Grail. And so the idea is, if you also drink from this cup, you can live forever. I eventually had this thought. This guy, who's been alive for 500 plus years, is a middle-aged, you know, a knight from the Middle Ages. Um, He's been alive for a really long time, by himself, in a cave, the size of a room. He hasn't seen any other human beings. He hasn't gotten to play soccer or have an ice cream sundae or see outside, or even talk to anybody in over 500 years. So I'm thinking, is that really the kind of life that you want? Uh, The idea, I think, that we're going to see here as we talk about everlasting life is it's not just the quantity that matters, but the quality It's not just life that never ends, but how good is the life you're talking about? Uh, So this kind of thinking, uh, these kinds of stories, uh, have been around, as I mentioned, uh, for a really, really long time. Uh, I see it in science fiction uh, and fantasy and that kind of thing, which I really enjoy. Uh, You see stories about immortals who have been of some kind, who have lived for centuries, which has already always really interested me. Because uh, I think, how cool would it be to talk to somebody who's still alive, who has seen the 1900s, all of it, who's seen the 1800s and seen the 1700s? What kind of wisdom would they have? What could, what could they tell us about how you know, things have changed? How, how fascinating that would be. And then I think, man, would you really want to do that? Like, is there a point in time which living in this life, in this world, you might just get really tired of it? And tired of the difficulty, and tired of your own sin, and tired of other people's sin, and tired of this fallen world. I mean, is that really what you want? 
Um, same for science fiction stories about people uh, doing all kinds of things to achieve long life, whether it's transferring their heads, their brains into the mind of a robot computer or clones or you know some such thing. The idea really is not quality of life, it's just to have it longer. And so again, the same, my same question, what really matters is, is it just how long it lasts or how good it is? And can you have one without the other? And so as we go into the passage today, we've been, pre we've been going through uh, the, letter, the first letter of John's, 1 John. And we're in the middle of chapter 5 right now, which is his conclusion of the book. And the title of this morning's message is Confidence. And so I'm going to read all the way up to, beginning with verse 1, all the way up to the passage that we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to focus on this morning is verses uh, 12 through 15. Okay, that's where our focus is going to be in verses 12 through 15. So when I get there in my reading, that's when they'll appear on the screen. And that's when you should really pay attention. In the meantime, as I begin in verse 1, I just want you to listen and hear what John has been saying. This is his conclusion, beginning in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood, and the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And now we get to verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever ha does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. My prayer is that your word would give us this confidence this morning. Confidence that you know us, that you love us, that we have life in you everlasting, and confidence that you hear our prayers. And so, Lord, my prayer is that you would use this word, that you would use this time to make us more like Jesus in every way that that means, as far as how he lived his life, that you would help us to, through this message, to trust you as he did, to obey you as he did, to love as he did, and to pray as he did. And Lord, as we enter into this time of listening to your word, our prayer is that uh, looking ahead to the time which we leave, we exit this time of hearing your word, that we would leave having this kind of confidence that our life in Christ would be shaped by our time with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so in verse 11, John said, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. Eternal life. This is something that people want. They look for it. I mean, sometimes isn't that what it sort of seems like our society is doing? And I'm not beating up on the medical community here. I love the medical community. I think that what they do are gifts from God, and I'm thankful for them. 
But there are times when it really just seems like people are just trying to beat back the inevitable and just try, trying to fight. Eventually, right, we know what's going to happen. But God has given us eternal life, life that doesn't end. But as I asked earlier, what kind of life are we talking about? Because you and I struggle, don't we? We struggle with pain. We struggle with circumstances. We struggle with difficult people. We struggle with our own sin. We struggle with the sin that other people have that affects us. And we struggle in this fallen world. Do you really want this life forever? Listen to the second part of verse 11. And this life is in his son. The eternal life that John is talking about here is life in Christ. He's not just talking about not dying or living forever. He is talking about life in the Son. He's not just talking about quantity. He's talking about quality. That you, as a believer, you have life in Jesus right now. Like, you have that right now. And think about how these two ideas, and I'm saying quality and quantity, go together. If you were just living this difficult, hard life that we all live, how long do you really want to do this before your patience would wear out, right? But God gives us life in his son. And the reason why this life is so difficult is because of sin. Because of the fall, the world in which we live in has diseases and earthquakes and tornadoes. Because of sin, other people do things that harm us, whether it, have to do, whether it be financial harm or physical harm or emotional harm or social harm and every other way you can think of because of other people's sin. And we struggle with sin in our own lives. But we have this promise that the eternal life we're talking about will not always struggle with those things. At, what point, at one point, those things will be removed. And not only the stain of sin will be removed from you, but the power of sin and the presence of sin. And so the eternal life that we have in His Son will be quality and so good. Now imagine that, that God gives you this life in His Son, a life of freedom from the impact of sin and the struggle with sin. And then He says, oh, it's only temporary. If you and I, if our bodies don't wear out and we don't have all the problems that I described and we have life in the sun, who would want that to end? Would it be a kind of cruelty for God to only give it for a little while, this wonderful life, and then to take it away? Or would it be a kind of a cruelty to tell us, you have to live forever, but you have to live forever in suffering? No, God is loving and kind. And so what he gives us is good, quality life in life that doesn't end. But here's the key. In both cases, it's quality and it's everlasting only because of Jesus. You can't have the everlasting part without the Jesus part. Uh, one pastor put it this way. He said, look, as a test, ask yourself, if, if in heaven I could have whatever I wanted forever, but God wasn't there, would you still want to go? The reason why this life is quality, this eternal life that John is talking about, is because it, it, because it is life in his son. It is life in Jesus, that he lives in us. We live in him. We abide in him. And it does not have to end. We get Jesus forever. That's awesome. This also speaks of relationships. We have life in his son. Do you know I get up in the morning, we, we rise in the S-O-N shine of Jesus. When we, when we go to bed at night, you lie down in the S-O-N shine of, of Jesus. That every single part of your day, you have life in his son. And then we get to verse 12. Whoever has the son has life. It is only through him that you have it. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Which means, as an aside, and we talked about this last week, that rather than looking at people who don't have Jesus as the enemy, that are trying to steal everything from us, 
We need to see that you and I, if we have Jesus, we have what they need. We have what they want. They're just looking for it in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways. But we actually have that. And so rather than looking at them as the, the enemy, we should look at them as people who need exactly what we have and we can give them through our testimony. Whoever has the Son has life. Life now. Because life in the Son today, now, is not like life without the Son. Now, I know that life is still a struggle and you have a hard time with the same stuff that people who don't have the Son have. But you have Jesus. This is where we faith it as a verb. This is where we trust that it will not always be like this. This is where we trust that God is making us more and more and more like his son Jesus. That he who began a work in us will be faithful to complete it in that day of Christ Jesus. And so we trust and we have faith that each day he is making us more and more like his son. And that even on those days when we don't feel it, and there are days we don't feel it, that you still have life in his son. Now look at verse 13. In verse 13, John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he knows that not everybody who's hearing this is a Christian. Because there are false teachers who believe false things and don't actually, have not actually been born of God that he's been referring to all the way through this book. And he knows that some of those people are probably hearing this letter. And so what he has given them is he's given them three tests. Look, this is how you know you're a believer. If you obey his commandments and when you fail, you, for, you ask for forgiveness through Christ and you believe you have that forgiveness. The general de- direction of your life is following Jesus. Not that you won't ever sin, but that when you do, you know you have a Savior and you have forgiveness. Second, that you love the Lord, that you love God, knowing that he first loved you and he sent his son Jesus. And third, that you love one another. Do you love other Christians? If you love the Father, you're going to love his children. You're going to love those who have been born of him. And so these are the three tests. And so now that you know that you belong to him, John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And you think, okay, that's me. Notice the phrase of the name here, because name of the Son of God does not just mean you have Jesus written on your t-shirt. Or just that you say Jesus, but that you believe in his authority and what he did and in what he does and what he accomplished for you. You believe you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, this is interesting because he actually tells us the purpose of his letter. This is why I wrote this. He tells us near the end, right? Thanks for making us wait, John. But he does. In the end of the letter, we find out why he wrote this. You know, he does the same exact thing in his gospel. In the Gospel of John, in the very end, he says, I wrote this so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you would have, by believing, you would have life in his name. He tells us that the reason for his gospel, for his eyewitness testimony about Jesus, is so that you would have faith in Christ, so that you would have eternal life in the Son. So it's for the non-believer to become a believer. That's the purpose of the gospel. But then he writes this letter to you after you've become a Christian. And he tells us this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's not trying to help us to be saved. We're already saved. We already believe. We already belong. So what's your purpose in writing, John? That you may know that you have eternal life. So first, he says in his gospel, I write these things so that you will have eternal life. Right? And now he writes, I write these things so that you will know you have eternal life. So there's a, there's a pattern we see in his gospels and in his, in his letters. Here's the ex- expected pattern. He expects you to go through four stages. One that you hear, that you hear the gospel. And then upon hearing, you believe. And then upon believing, you live life in his son. And then as you live life in his son, you know that you belong to him. John wants you to have assurance. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, wait a minute, isn't believing and knowing the same thing? What he wants you to have is confidence 
in what you say you believe and what you believe. That you can move from just saying, I believe, to I know. And then you would have assurance of this. He doesn't want you to have a counterfeit knowing. He doesn't want you to have the placebo effect. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe, it will help you live a better life. He wants you to know with confidence that life you have in the Son is real and that it makes a difference. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. He's already told us that this life is in his Son. So we have the quality. We have life in Jesus. And it doesn't have to end. It is ongoing. It's present now. So we have the experience of being Christians. We've been saved. But now something else is going on. Once you're saved, now you live life in his son. Let me explain it to you this way. There is, uh, everybody loves giving gifts, right? Everybody, I do. I love giving gifts. Love giving them. Love getting them. But the only kind of gift you give isn't just an object. It's also experiences, right? This is why we go on vacation. This is why we do stuff. Especially if you do something with someone else. Why? Because you want to give the gift of memory. You want them to remember going to Disney World. You want them to remember going camping. You want to remember them feeding the camel and the camel's all slobbering on their arm and everybody laughs, right? You want them to have the experience. Now, you can't take the camel feeding with you. You can't put the camel in your pocket. You can't put the fishing trip in your pocket or the trip to Disney World or whatever that experience is. You can't, but you have your memory. It happened, and it was good. And so why do we take pictures? We take pictures because you can't put the camel in your pocket. You take pictures because you can't bring Disney World with you. It's because you can't have that experience over and over. It happened. And so you remember it, and it's good, and you're thankful for it. And so you have pictures from those trips. You also, if you know Christ, you have been saved. There was a moment in time in which you placed your, even if you don't remember that specific moment, there was a moment in which you placed your trust in Christ. And that happened. And so God gives us a picture. He gives us baptism. He gives us baptism, which is a beautiful picture of you dying to the old self and rising to walk in newness of life, that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And you have a physical, visible, tangible reminder of what Christ has done for you. He's given you baptism. But you're saved once. You're rescued once. And there are a lot of Christians who think that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that's for kindergartners. That's for elementary school. Give me the deep stuff now. I know about getting saved. I've been baptized. I know that Jesus died for our sins. You put your trust in him. You're forgiven. You have everlasting life. Now what? Let's go. I want the the really big words. I I want to really dig in. Let's, you know, that I want to be as spiritual as that lady over there. Let's go. But maybe you don't realize is the reason that that lady over there is so spiritual is she's still clinging to the gospel. <laughs> but those really big words, that they're good when they point you to the gospel. The gospel is rich and beautiful, like a meal that never ends, and it just gets better and better and better. It's not just life that God has given you and that you experienced. It is an ongoing and continual gift. You have life in the sun right now. There are three truths that we learn from these verses. One, that your eternal life in the sun, quality and quantity, is not a prize. It's not something you earned. It's not the trophy that you get after you you blew up the Death Star and and a gold medal that represents eternal life gets put around your neck. Ta-da, look at what I accomplished. It's It's not something that you've earned. It is a gift that is undeserved. Number two, it is found only in Christ. This is not everlasting life that just doesn't end. Oh, I have eternal life because I bought my ticket. I got my Jesus ticket, so I get to live forever. No, it is life in the Son. It is relationship with Him. We Christians like to say, well, Christianity is religion, not relationship. Not entirely true. It's true in the sense that 
religions are man-made and people trying to get to God. And Christianity is different because God came to us. And rather than works and earning it, this is a free gift. In that sense, it's different than religion. But in the sense, it is a system of belief. It's things that we believe are true. It is a religion. It's just better than the others because it's true. Because it's right. But it is also a relationship. And I would argue that it's not true religion if it isn't also relationship. Because that's the message of Christianity. Is having life in the Son forever. And so God gave us his Son and he gives us his Son. You rise with him and you lie, and you lie down with him. You, he is with you every part of the day. Your life is in him. And number three, and this is part of what I'm talking about, it is a present possession. It's not eternal life. Everlasting life is not something you just look forward to. It's something that you have now. It's not been brought to completion. You and I still struggle with sin, but we have life in the Son right now. And then we move to the second kind of confidence. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence. So we know, we have confidence that we have eternal life in his Son. And then here's another confidence he gives us in verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What a promise. To, to begin with, not just that we, if we ask anything according to his will, but that we have confidence in it. This is a freedom of speech is what this is. I know you're lighting up when you hear that, right? The freedom is you get to tell God what it is that you want, and he listens to you. We have confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, I will tell you that lawsuits are really fun to read when they involve somebody else. When they involve you, they're not quite so fun. And I was reading, that was supposed to be a joke, and it's okay. Crickets, chirp, chirp, it's all right. So uh, I was reading a lawsuit once, and I came across this phrase, this is our prayer. Like, that is really weird. Like, why would you say prayer to a judge? He's a judge, he's not God. I mean, the only time in which I'd ever heard the word used is talking to God. And then I found out that every lawsuit has this. They, they all present, a, and it's headlined that way in the lawsuit, prayer. Now, what? And the prayer is the request. It's like, oh, what's going on here? Well, a prayer is any time that someone goes to an authority and asks for something. And it's a formal request. And one of the first things that a judge will have to decide is whether or not you have standing before the court. If you have even a right to be there and to ask for this. And if you don't have standing, bye-bye. I'm not listening. We have confidence that we approach the judge, Lord, creator of the universe, and you have standing every single time you talk to him on any subject. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Which means... And this may be the one, and I, if you only remember one thing out of this sermon, I'm hoping it'll be this one. You ready? Here it is. This means he is more willing to listen to you than you and I are to pray. Now, I don't say that with a, like condemnation. Okay? I'm not like picking on you. You should pray more. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying you should pray more. I'm saying you get to pray more. Like, this is awesome. So I'll say the statement again. He's more willing to listen than we are to pray. In other words, you don't, if you prayed for 24 hours, went and took a 30-minute nap, and come back and say, God, I'm back, he's not going to go, oh, again? He was waiting those 30 minutes till for you to come back. He wants to hear you. He wants to listen. All the time, in the morning, at night, during your day, in your busyness, you got an hour to dedicate to prayer, awesome. You got five minutes, awesome. You got one sentence, awesome. He wants to hear you all the time. When you're happy, sad, mad. When you're victorious, when you're beaten down. When you really have strong faith, when you have weak faith. At every moment, he wants to hear. And not just about the big stuff, but the little stuff. If we ask anything according to his will, he 
hears us. He's listening. Now, does that only mean that he's listening? Or does this also mean that he's going to do something about it? Let's look at verse 15. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So there's the answer. It's not just that he's listening, but he wants to answer. He wants to respond. I will admit as a dad that when my kids go, hey, dad, I need you. Those are sweet words. I want them to need me. I want them to ask you for stuff. You know why? Because I love them. And I get to do things for them. You're not bugging God when you ask. He can say, I've been waiting. He wants to hear you ask about the big and the little. And he wants to answer. He wants to give. Jesus said, look, if, you, if your son asks for bread, are you going to give him a rock? No, but you who are evil, evil, you know to give your kids good things. How much more your heavenly father wants to give you good things. He wants to answer our prayers. We have... We know that he hears us in whatever we ask, and we know that have, we have the requests we have asked for him. Well, there's a couple of questions that come to mind. One is, how come we don't get at everything? Right? I mean, it says here that we do, so how come we don't? Well, one reason is because he's good and kind and loving, and not everything you ask for is good for you. Which we know that, right? We know that. There's, we know there's certain things we ask for that it's probably good that prayer didn't get answered. There's other stuff we ask for that other people get it. How come I can't? And that's where faith comes in. That's when trust comes in, that his will and his knowledge of you is better than yours, that he sees things you don't. Let's move the verse back to uh, verse 14. I don't know how many of you noticed that I didn't talk about this phrase. Did you notice I skipped it? I saved it for right now. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And he will give to us. And he will respond. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. He taught us to pray by example. When he prayed in the garden, Lord, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. He taught us to pray this way. He taught us to pray for the things that God wants. Which, by the way, I want you to notice that you shouldn't be afraid to pray for things you want. Because Jesus did it. Lord, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. He actually asked for it. It's okay to ask for it. So why then does God have us pray when we may not necessarily get what we ask for? Two reasons. The first reason is so that we learn that our will needs to bend to his. Prayer is not God as the genie. God is the magician that you can just access whenever you want it, and you're bending his will to yours. I can call down lightning from heaven on you. Bam! It's a good thing not all of our prayers get answered. Right? That's not what this is. This is not God's will bending to ours, but our will bending to his, and God uses prayer to do that. Well, if God's going to do what he wants anyway, why should we pray? Because he wants you to ask, to build a relationship with you, with, and your dependence and your trust, your faith in him, so that you know where the good gifts come from. If it just happens, what's the phrase we use? Take it for granted, right? Which I always thought was an interesting phrase, because everything you have is granted to you. But you know if you ask and he responds, you know where it came from. And it builds your relationship with him. And so we pray because it bends our will to his in the process of prayer. And because we learn dependence on him and where every good thing comes from. And so let us pray like Jesus. When we pray in his name, this means not just that it's a magic password for God to hear us. If you were his child, you were already praying in Jesus' name, even if you don't say it out loud, because it's because of the name of Christ that you were a child of God and he hears you. But to pray in his name 
though I think it's good to say out loud as a reminder that we come to him because of Christ, means to pray as Jesus would pray, to pray the kinds of things that Jesus would pray for. Which, what an awesome thing to think about. Think about that. Think about you and I praying our prayers and praying like Jesus would. Isn't that awesome? That as you are praying and learning more to submit to his will, that that very act of prayer is God making, making you more and more like Jesus and that you will pray more and more like Jesus does and God wants to answer those prayers. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, my prayer is that you would give us the confidence through your spirit and the power of your word that we have heard today, that we belong to you, that we have life in the Son, and that this life is everlasting. Lord, for those who know Jesus who are here, my prayer is that they would leave this place because of you with that confidence. And Lord, that we would also have confidence that you hear our prayers, that you care about what we have to say, whether big or small, that our cries are important to you. As you bend not your will to us, but bend your ear. And so, Lord, we pray that you would make us more and more like Jesus, which we know is your will for us because your word says so. And that you would use these, these two truths we've heard this morning to make us more like Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
into our lives and change our hearts, give us a new heart to love you and to love each other, love Jesus, love the church, and that your glory would be made through that. And I pray that we would continue to offer our lives as a living sacrifice to you in worship as a reaction to what you've done in ours. In your son's name we pray, amen. May grace and peace be with you. Thank God for coming.